Do you ever feel like the whole world has gone insane? Yeah, you're not alone. I feel that way. In fact, the majority of people feel that way. The truth is, we were all sold this great lie that being part of a silent majority was something we should be proud of. Being a silent majority allowed a very loud, angry group of people to control everything. And problem there is, that small group of people, they're communists. I say that myself as someone who's the son of a Cuban refugee who had to flee communism. I know the reality of how important the American dream is. I know how quickly we can lose freedom. And that's why this is our last stand. I'm your host, Robbie Starbuck, and I'm gonna be diving deep on the issues and people that matter so that together we can save the American dream and once again become a loud majority that steers the direction of this country. If you're with me and you wanna spread truth and wake up the masses, you're in the right place. Together, one piece of truth at a time, we can save America. The collection of interviews you're about to see includes anonymous people. And I want to explain why that is. Many of these people were afraid for their jobs, their livelihoods, and their ability to operate in the future without losing their licenses. In order to quell that fear and get the truth, I granted anonymity, but I did vet that they are in fact doctors, are in fact nurses, and that vetting process was thorough and ensured that nobody was able to slip through who was not who they say they are and not in the job they say they have. So I was able to ensure that all of these people have the careers you're about to hear about and they're giving you the insight without the filter of worrying about what could happen to them in their career or in their community or anything along those lines. So I think you're getting the raw, unfiltered truth from these people as a byproduct of us granting that anonymity. I hope that you find these interviews as enlightening as I did. With me now, we've got Marielle Washburn. She worked as an EMT in Rhode Island and saw the realities of what played out during COVID. So I wanted to bring her on today to talk about what she saw, what she experienced, and how this touched her own life. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to dive right in. As an EMT, you guys often see the very first sort of rawest picture of what's going on with patients. When COVID started, when did you know something was wrong? When, when did you know something was different? Right. So first, initially, there was kind of a hysteria. We were all as afraid as anyone else. And what we saw first were the people who were already very sick getting much sicker and people that were generally healthy having sort of a cold. And yeah. so pretty quickly, we realized that the reality wasn't what we were being told on the news. And so, you know, one question I know is is especially on the mind of viewers is, once people began to get vaccinated for COVID, did you see any change in terms of side effects or who was getting sick and things along those lines when you looked at vaccinated versus unvaccinated? Well, what did you see? What was your your experience? The scale tipped a bit. Um, we saw a little bit less calls for COVID and almost even calls for COVID vaccine reactions, which were fairly similar to the symptoms of COVID. So you were seeing just about 50-50 COVID vaccine reactions or side effects and COVID. It was pretty much equal in, in terms of what you were getting called out for? Perhaps not initially, but as the vaccine got more prevalent, it about evened out. And so when you look at that, the types of calls you were getting for vaccine side effects, what did they look like? Were these cardiac events? Were they What were they? What did it look like generally? I would say the majority were not. The majority were those week after kind of side effects of fever and chills and those symptoms that were much like COVID. I would say that symptoms of chest pain or something that might lead you to think myocarditis were few and far between for us. They weren't every vaccine reaction. That's interesting. This ended up touching your own life. You chose not to get vaccinated. And in that choice, you ended up facing discrimination from your own department, and you've shared with, with us uh, three letters. And in these letters, you know, I'll let you explain them, but it, it sort of progressively gets worse in terms of, you know, the, the threat to your job and then the suspension and then afterwards, basically, hey, we're going to get your license pulled and we're going to report you to the health department. Is that an accurate portrayal of these these three letters? Yes, but some interesting facts were that 
the reports that they made to the health department or that we were working unvaccinated when we were not in fact working. We had already been suspended and the health department did not in fact pull our licenses, but they still moved to fire us. So they didn't end up pulling your licenses. And no. now you're you're in dispute to try to get your job back. I'm assuming you loved your job, correct? I did. And you were doing this for almost 10 years, right, as an EMT? Yes. How did you see your workplace change as a result of COVID and the vaccine? W were things different around there? Did you face any sort of discrimination in the workplace in terms of how people treated you? I wouldn't say that I felt that, no. Um, we were sort of all subjected to wear masks within the station and all of the all of the COVID guidelines that were put out at the time. I would say that the majority of people in the workplace were of the same mind, but not everybody was able to hold out and risk getting fired. That's something I hear a lot, is that the vast majority of people agree with the people who did end up holding out, but that they personally felt they couldn't take the risk of losing their job. What percentage would you put on that? How many of the people, just ballpark guests, agreed with you within the workplace, but ended up just not being able to hold the line because they, they couldn't risk their job? We had about 100 people that swore up and down that they weren't going to get it, um, that they didn't believe in it, and that they wouldn't, and five of us in the end got fired. That's incredible. And out of how many people, you know, roughly are are in employment in that department? We have about 400 guys. And so about about a quarter of them um, had said, absolutely not, we won't do it and ended up doing it. Let me ask you this, because this, this comes up in every interview that I've done. People talk about the fact that there is a large number of, of folks using fake vaccine cards. Why didn't you use a fake vaccine card the way so many other people did? I think that there were a lot of easy outs. There were ways to get medical exemptions. I didn't try for a religious exemption. I just, I don't believe that they should be able to push us around like this. I think that we should have autonomy. I believe strongly that our health is our, our right and our responsibility to take care of. Um, and I don't think that anybody should be able to push an experiment on us. Well, I think you're incredibly brave for doing that and for standing up. You know, one of the things I've criticized, and you you can feel free to disagree with me if you disagree. I've criticized men in this process. Um, I feel like not enough men have stood up and taken the risks that we really should be leading on. And that's not to say that women shouldn't be leading on it. it it's really just that men biologically, I have a, a real problem with the fact that they're not standing up and being the leaders that I believe they were made to inherently be and, and to be strong and to be the people who stand up for the vulnerable. And I don't think a lot of men have done that. I think that, you know, largely I've seen women standing up in these fights. The vast majority of the interviews I'm doing in the medical industry are women. And the vast majority of men who have reached out again are doctors or even nurses who say that they're afraid to go on camera, but the women are. Have you experienced this? Yeah, I have. I have. Do you think there's a problem there? I do. What do you think's at the root of it? What What's at the root of why men aren't standing up? I don't understand what more it's going to take to get men to stand up. Maybe it's a, a biological thing, a concern that they won't be able to provide, whereas women are more fiercely defending their children or their future children. I mean, maybe. You know, part of me feels like the more we submit, the more likely it becomes that we all lose our livelihoods because eventually you submit to such a degree that you're really just owned by the state. And once you're owned by the state, you have no wiggle room. And, you know, even just thinking unpopular thoughts will eventually become a thought crime in itself. I mean, they're already doing at a lot of these big tech companies a lot of research into actually being able to track people's memories and their thoughts. And it's not a foregone conclusion that we're not going to end up in a place where that's going to become a mandate in itself because once you accept one mandate you're unable to really like set a line and a boundary and say well i'm not willing to accept this mandate because once you accept the authority of a mandate that your government has the right to just force inject you at any point what can they not inject you with and that's kind of been a question i had to some you know very pro-vaccine mandate um 
people is, is, is where is the line? What can they not inject into you? And I have yet to receive any sort of answer when it comes to that. But on the male point, you know, I really hope that there's an awakening among men to stand up the way that you have, because you're being a leader and a fighter in, in taking this stand. And I think that more people have to do it. I've got to ask you this question. Is there any sort of organization? organization or organized, you know, sort of a push with other people who are experiencing the same thing? Have you been able to become part of any kind of group to support each other and help push toward a future where you're free to make your own decision? Within our department of, um, we've, we've come together as a small group, the five of us, and we just sort of hash out ideas and we consulted a lawyer together and we're just kind of sticking together. I would say via social media and sharing ideas there. It's been cool to see how communities develop um, and you find like-minded people, but I haven't formally come together with any group. Well, this is why, you know, a lot of the people in global power hate social media and hate the internet because it really has provided an outlet for people to form communities and to find out they're not alone and to realize that, wow, a lot of people actually think exactly the way I do. And I'm not crazy as much as the state or the mainstream media try to gaslight me. There's a whole group of people and researchers and scientists and doctors and nurses and EMTs who stand alongside me, who believe that this is a problem and that the state has really gone far beyond any authority that they think they have. And so, you know, I think that that's one of the more incredible things that has happened throughout COVID is the ability for all of us to form these relationships online, because sometimes now, you know, um, I hear from people, so many people, they feel like they have better friends online than they do in real life. And, and that's sort of a dangerous thing, but also during COVID really saved a lot of people, you know, it saved a lot of people from a really dark place. I'm not sure it's the healthiest thing for the future, but I do think that, you know, the connections we make online are important for just getting the truth out there. And I think that's that's really the most valuable thing about it. So I'm glad that, you know, the Internet's been there in some some way, some shape or form to let you know you're not alone and that, you know, this is happening in so many places. And I think that's that's one of the things I've been experiencing over the past two weeks is I've gotten so many emails from people telling their vaccine injury story or their story of how, you know, mandates affected their life or their job and realizing how many of them felt like they were alone until they were able to form communities online or become a part of, you know, a movement online that that really opened up their eyes to how many people were affected the same way they were. And it gives people strength, it gives them power, it gives them the inspiration they need to move forward. So um, I'm happy about that. Thank you, Internet. <laughs> <laughs> But what's the next step look like for you in terms of accountability for the people who did this and, you know, really getting compensated for what you went through? Because here's the thing. I read one of those letters and it honestly it reads like a communist threat where they say, if you don't get vaccinated, we're going to send your status to the health department and get your license revoked. While they didn't end up actually revoking your license, the fact that the government you know, somebody who's using taxpayer dollars could could even consider that sort of thing is shocking. I think that it's really amazing that they created that paper trail for themselves, because looking back now, it looks almost incriminating. Um, and the fact that they went... It doesn't look almost incriminating. It looks very incriminating. <laughs> and the fact that they went to my licensing agency and lied to them feels slanderous to me. And now looking at it on paper and seeing, you told me you were going to do this. That's crazy. Um, it's really jaw-dropping, honestly. We're going to have it up here so people can see it. But it's it's unbelievable. I mean, I would say it's unbelievable, but it's not unbelievable anymore. It would have been unbelievable five years ago. It's not unbelievable now. And And that's, you know, I think one of the really sad things about what we've all been through is that if you went back five years ago and you told your average person, no matter what their political affiliation was, that, hey, the government's going to try to force a mask on your face, force a needle in your arm with something that you may or may not understand or may or may not know what's in it. You may or may not know what the side effects are going to be in 15 years, and they're going to force you to be fired from your jobs and rip away your livelihoods if you don't allow them to do this. People would have said that's crazy. There's absolutely no way that that's going to happen or that we would accept that happening. And yet, here we are. And so I always 
try to encourage people to make some sort of change in their life. And and my encouragement for people is watching brave people like like yourself set boundaries. Set boundaries, people. You know, Marielle had her boundary. She stood there and she held the line and she said, I'm not crossing this this boundary. I'm not going to allow the state to do this. I'm not going to allow my employer to do this. And I'm going to hold strong to my values. The more all of us do that, the less it becomes necessary to do that. Because powerful entities become afraid of the people when the people all individually make the decision to uphold their values and their morals and don't compromise for anything. Do you agree with that? I agree with that. I think that when they saw that some of us wouldn't just bow down, that's when they got fearful and angry and they saw it as an act of defiance and I think that that's why they chose to punish. There were some other interesting things about our circumstance in particular, one of them being that we had to really push our union president at the time to to do anything to represent us and he was very left-leaning and very public about it even posting memes on instagram mocking those of us that felt this way and he very recently got moved to the chief of the department and wow then who told us you will never get your jobs back if you choose this so wow you use the word accountability and that's exactly what i'm what i'm looking for i just want I mean, that's 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 blatant discrimination. I think that there's fantastic grounds for, uh, you know, employment action, lawsuits, uh, litigation in general. I think there's there's no question you guys were discriminated against, in my view, seeing this and hearing those statements. That's just unacceptable on every level. And, you know, I do think that that's another thing that happened throughout COVID is it really exposed a lot of unions as the farce that they've become because so many of them have just become political action committees who are out there to support a certain party and that's all they exist to do. And the reality of unions and what they were meant to do, helping workers, has kind of been lost in the shuffle because the reality is if you're truly there for workers, you realize that your workers are going to have varying political beliefs and that it's extremely polarizing for the head of your union to be publicly blasting the beliefs of members of the union. How can they feel protected? How can they feel like you're fighting for them if you're out there essentially making fun of them left and right? I mean, that just seems like something that, that you can't do if you're running a union. It sure does. Hey ladies, I wanted to tell you about a new skincare line called Charlize. They are American made, American owned, and non-toxic ingredients for our skin. And it works, it's effective. I've used it and I continue to use it. I love these products, amazing ingredients, and my skin has never felt better. So I hope that you'll try it and enjoy it. You can use the link down below and let me know how you like it. We've got an anonymous doctor joining us today. We verified that they are, in fact, a doctor who has treated COVID patients and has dealt with this crisis since it's began. And we wanted to really dig into a number of issues. Number one, why doctors feel the need at this point to stay anonymous, because this has been something we've ran into many, many times, and there is good reason for why they feel this way. But also to ask, what has the experience been without having to worry about, you know, any potential kickback or or uh, blow to their credibility or their job or ability to practice. So I want them to feel unencumbered and able to just answer these questions. So without further ado, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So diving right in, how has COVID changed your entire business? You know, I mean, this is this is something you've worked in medicine for a long time. How has it changed the fundamentals of the way you work? Uh, yeah, so I've been a doctor for, you know, 15 plus years, and um, this has been something that I never really could imagine that I would see. Uh, so when it first started, you know, nobody was an expert in what we were seeing, and so that's the time to use your kind of novel thinking, uh, reach back in into all the biology and physiology and think what's going to be helpful. Uh, but even when you started to do that, there were people that were telling you, you know, that that you couldn't do certain things, but we didn't know the right, the right answer was, but they just knew that there were certain wrong answers, certain medications you weren't supposed to use, certain treatments you weren't supposed to do, that there was a disconnect between what I saw in my community, in my hospital, in my clinic, and what I was being told on air, uh, on the television set, and that didn't seem right to me. 
Well, what yeah, that yeah, disconnect? Like uh, how lethal, for one thing, it was, uh, what populations it was affecting. It was very clear to me that from the onset that, that COVID was going to impact um, disabled people much more, obese people, uh, people who were elderly, and that the young people were doing quite well with it, uh, even during yeah. Delta time. Yeah. What would you say, you know, has changed since the introduction of the vaccine? It was interesting. A lot of people put up um, different ways to communicate to the to different media outlets or different news outlets. And one of the ways is like they, they always showed, you know, like bodies of people, like how many people were in the hospital that were vaccinated or unvaccinated. And um, in the beginning, there were a lot of pictures of, you know, how many people were in that were unvaccinated, but it didn't seem to to consistently jive. Um, yeah. I mean, I knew what people were in the hospital and and there were some times when they were showing uh that all the people in the hospital were unvaccinated, yet I'm looking at the hospital with vaccinated people in it. Yeah. And now, if they were to put up that same finding, the vast majority are vaccinated. Is that the reason and they're not putting these numbers out as consistently now? I don't know what the numbers are, but it seem, I don't know why the reason is, but it seems like if you put those same things up, people would be very concerned. You know, people that, that in the beginning took on face value that they should get vaccinated now are like, wait, I got the disease too. I'm like, yes, you did. So yeah, we just uh, saw a report last week showing that the more vaccinations you had had of the COVID uh, vaccine, that you were actually more likely to get sick. Is that what you're seeing? It wouldn't, it certainly wouldn't surprise me if that was the statistics. Now that can be skewed, right? Because a lot of that elderly and disabled people were more likely to get vaccinated as well. But uh, the question is then, is the vaccine, what is the vaccine actually benefiting? Okay. So if it doesn't avoid transmission, and we talked about how it reduced hospitalization by a, uh, by a, a little bit, but then it changed from Delta where we had a lot of hospitalizations to the new variants where we have very few hospitalizations then what is the true benefit of the vaccine and to who, which groups? Certainly not to young people, certainly not to healthy people. And what are the true risks associated with COVID vaccine and how do we find out about them? Well, that's a good question right there. What are the true risks? What are you seeing in practice? You know, have you seen side effects from the vaccine and what does that look like? Uh, I have seen side effects from the vaccine. Um, there are some individuals that experience uh, autoimmune-like conditions, uh, people that have um, antibodies uh, that can cause type 1 diabetes, Hashimoto's, neurologic conditions. Um, I would say that the number one thing I've seen in my practice is this vague uh, neurologic condition, which makes it hard to detect whether what is coming from, neuropathy, we call it small fiber disease, but the only way to tell it's small fiber disease for sure is through a biopsy, which are not readily available except for in very large centers. So people get what are called paresthesias. They get numbness, tingling. Sometimes they get uh, limbs that don't feel quite right. They get feeling like they're walking on marshmallows. There are lots of other reasons why people would get neuropathy as well. So blaming it only on the vaccine is hard to know as well. That's why they should have done randomized controlled studies to know the difference, right? This yeah, have you seen anything like this yet. before with other vaccines? Uh, no, no. And I, I, I get vaccinated a lot of people. I obviously have dealt with things like myasthenia gravis or Guillain-Barre from flu vaccines, but that's very rare. That's very unusual. And the problem is, is that there's no specific test to say, yes, this person has a vaccine injury. You know, there are some, I've looked at REACT-19, and I think that they have some helpful labs they have some helpful guidance, but there's this is new territory. And so if you go to a physician and you say, I have these symptoms, and the physician's just like, well, we know it's not the COVID-19 vaccine, how do you ever get it worked up? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's a great point. What do you think, in your view as a doctor, places like the CDC need to be doing if they were doing a competent job of actually searching out what kind of dangers there are and risks that are truly being posed now and in the future to American citizens? I don't believe that anybody can rely on the VAERS, uh, test, the VAERS uh, reporting system because physicians have approximately 15 minutes to see a, f- a patient. They have, they have to get in a chart, which takes about three to four minutes. They have to review their data. 
they have to go in and visit with the patient and then they have to document which takes another three to four minutes so they literally have about seven minutes with the patient they have bucket work they have to do they have all kinds of other things besides seeing patients that they have to do so the idea that then they're going to jump on a website to report vaccine injuries only to probably put themselves at risk of of somebody saying what are you doing or or uh, why are you talking about this i don't think that's a reliable system what should have happened is is what happens with everything we should have had a cohort that received the vaccine a cohort that didn't receive the vaccine they should have been randomized and controlled for covid disease itself and then we should have studied the neurologic complications the heart complications the immunologic complications so that we truly knew if this vaccine was safe or not and we should do that for years and years and years we shouldn't we certainly should not mandate that people get a experimental medication that we really do not know the long-term consequences of Yeah, and you know, that's a view that Dr. Fauci actually shared many years ago when people were suggesting an AIDS vaccine. He responded back to the media and said essentially that, you know, his big worry was that, well, if we go and rush something out, it may be safe for one year, maybe two, but we don't know that all help may break loose 12 years down the line if we do that. And we weren't prepared for it because essentially, you know, they they didn't plan for that future long-term possibility. And it seems to me that that's the missing piece where a lot of this fell apart and got in trouble. And the question I think a lot of people have at this point was, was that intentional? Was that laziness? Was that a rush to try to stop something that they were overhyping? What was the reason that they they got to that point? And I think the other part of it is you look at something like masks. Again, Fauci had previously had a very different position on masks and then changed it when COVID came around and people have those same questions. Why and how? You know, what changed? And without them pointing to a variable that changed and being able to say, oh, well, the size of the virus changed or something along those lines and that that allowed them to feel comfortable in thinking that masks would somehow protect people, which we all know is not the case if you actually look at the data, you know, People deserve answers on all all these fronts and more than just deserving answers. I think it's about ethical medicine, because one of the things that I will say has bothered me a lot just on an ethical basis is that, you know, informed consent seems to be a lost art within medicine. And I feel like that's something that should be paramount. And I wonder, from your point of view, How prevalent do you think informed consent truly is when it comes to things like the COVID vaccine, when doctors sit down and talk to patients? Because from my experience, it's incredibly rare that patients feel like they actually truly had informed consent. I absolutely agree that it is uh, that it is a lost art. How do we give informed consent when we don't even have all the information that we need to give informed consent? I think it's very important that people understand that when you go to see a doctor that's a family medicine doctor or internist, you should know that when the COVID-19 vaccine came out, the American Board of Family Physicians and the American Board of Internal Medicine, uh, they made a statement and sent out a statement to all physicians that if they did not recommend the vaccine, it was considered vaccine misinformation or COVID-19 misinformation. And anybody that was accused of giving misinformation would lose their board licensure. So when you lose your board certification, you cannot work in medicine. You can't practice medicine essentially because nobody's going to hire you if you don't have board certification. So that being said, would that make you feel differently about the information given to your physician? And also, who is giving your information to your physician? Is your physician doing independent study? Is your physician going out and really researching things? And then if they are, how do you research something that information may or may not be being suppressed? Wow, that is that's something I think a lot of people do not know is that that was sent out and that these doctors were all uniformly threatened together, essentially, that, hey, step out of line and we're going to make sure you don't work again. I mean, it's not surprising. We've seen it in other industries as well, but I don't think a lot of people know that that happened. I don't feel like people understand really what happens in the back rooms of hospitals organizations and as we've moved into employment type of medicine where most physicians are employed you have constraints in within your organization if you say certain things if you practice in certain ways 
that are not consistent with what they believe or they have set about as standard of care, uh, which is fluid, right? It's decided by a group of individuals and it may or may not be science-based. The concern is like who's pulling the strings or who's actually making the decisions about what is right, what is wrong. And I think most people now know that there was reimbursement that followed, you know, the, these things as well. So if there were were people that like if you didn't have your hospital employees vaccinated, you lost CMS funding. Yeah. Well, yeah. what do you think is going to happen then? So does that seem like you can get informed consent? Does that seem like that's a free choice? Does that seem like that's going to be something that you're going to sit down and think about? Physicians don't just have unlimited income. Most of them are not just going to lose their job. You know, their families are depending on them, too. They have debt from medical school. So most of them are going to kind of fall in. Well, then what happens to the psychology once you have yourself taken a vaccine? W then what's the psychology behind that? What's the yeah. psychology behind m masks, too, as far as, like, have we really studied not just one consequence, which I don't, I, I, is a whole realm of itself. Does it protect you against anything? What are the other consequences of those? We, we have all kinds of information we're not, we're not sharing or looking at regarding any of those. You well, did absolutely. Ask we just saw a study out of Japan that showed that, you know, they found very dangerous bacterial infections inside of masks and they actually recommended, and this is the Japanese government, they actually recommended that people who were immunocompromised don't wear masks for any reason. You know, that's that's not a surprising study, honestly. I mean, I think that's actually something that if you had asked five years ago, pre-COVID, to most doctors, do you think it's a good idea for immunocompromised people to walk around wearing masks and potentially having bacteria form on the masks that they're then breathing in, they would all pretty much uniformly say that's a bad idea. I always learned, always learned, you, you decrease viral load by being in open air. We knew that, you know, we wanted airflow. We knew that we wanted people outside. Well, then is that consistent if you want somebody outside and you want free airflow to also put a mask on your face? Because that doesn't seem consistent to me. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And what I would ask, too, is, you know, that culture of you're almost you're describing sort of a culture of fear within the that world. You know, the doctors, you know, I mean, I think it's natural if they're being threatened in that way. And I don't think there's another way to describe it besides being threatened, because that's exactly what it sounds like. Is that the I mean, it sounds like a dumb question, but is that the reason why so many of them are afraid to speak out, even if they do disagree with what's going on? I absolutely believe that's part of it. I also think there's a group mentality where it's like, I think people kind of question their own ability to understand something. If if you think about this, you know, there's a group of physicians that really understand uh, vaccines and vaccine type medicine, infectious disease, family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, but it's probably harder for those that have practiced general surgery, for example, or uh, neurosurgery or anesthesia for a period of time to reach back into it. So when they're they're told like, hey, this is this is what is the deal. I think it's harder for them to reach back into their background because they've practiced that one field for so long. They have to depend on other people like the CDC and stuff to say, look, this is this is our uh, thought processing and this is who we kind of trust on this. Well, what happens if that breaks down and what happens if those aren't really the people that are trustworthy, what if they're being duly and in, unduly influenced by money, by by getting funding from certain people, then then the whole system breaks down. So I do feel like, you know, if somebody tells you that you're going to be fired, if you're if you don't wear a mask, do you wear a mask, you know, and then yeah. by wearing a mask, don't you just tell everybody else that you that you agree, even if you don't agree? So it's a, I think that there's a lot deeper psychology to this than people really understand. Oh, I, I agree with you. I think that, honestly, if I had to describe the entirety of COVID as anything, I would say psychological warfare. I mean, I feel like that's, that's really the root of, you know, maybe not the intent behind it, but I think that's the reality of what's played out is a psychological war that has really influenced a lot of people in very different ways. You know, and I think if you're in an industry where there is sort of a, a prevalent herd mentality for necessity of survival within that industry, you're leaning into whatever is going to lead towards survival more often than not um, by a pretty by a pretty wide margin. Now, you know, you mentioned, 
you know, the undue influence, whether it be monetary or something else, this is sort of where I get into the question of the effect that pharmaceutical companies have on doctors. What do you think that effect truly is? Because, I mean, we all know there's a relationship between pharmaceutical companies and doctors and medical institutions. How deep is it? And do you think that there's anything about it that could potentially be hurting the care of patients. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, in the old days when pharmaceutical uh, reps came in and gave, you know, free trips or free lunches or things like that, there was a lot of concern about undue influence. I personally didn't really feel like that was something that would ever influence me. Uh, but I can see how if you took a trip or you were a speaker or something like that, that could unduly influence. I think the more concerning thing is that if you look at who really actually researches vaccines right now, or if you look at who puts out the these studies right on this, the problem is that the pharmaceutical industry has infiltrated the uh, studies that are now biased, as far yeah. as I'm concerned. So the real problem is that if in order to find a unbiased study that is not tainted by the industry, is very very difficult. And the funding is just not there for people to do studies on things that they don't have an interest in. So I think that's the real, real problem with this. And then the flow of information, of course, of, well, where do you get your information from? How do you get your information? Who gives you your information? And if you take that backwards, who affected that? And if people don't believe that or they say, you know, follow the science, just look up two things. Look up uh, OxyContin and how OxyContin was uh, promoted and how information was suppressed and look at what Pfizer did with their drug that was an anti-inflammatory. Oh yeah, I mean we're talking about companies who have paid out, I mean, some of the the worst fines that have been levied uh because essentially of committing fraud in 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 many ways in terms of how they marketed things and how they treated people. And they absolutely that... are the ones that are that are lobbying uh in Washington. So the, oh, yeah. incestuous, no the incestuous relationship between Washington and lobbyists and at Big Pharma and big government is clear. Absolutely. And I think that's another thing that, that needs to change. I mean, if we're talking about a future where doctors can truly do no harm and where pharmaceutical companies can truly do no harm, there's a lot that needs to change. And I think that's one of the things then maybe maybe there's a positive out of this at the end of this. I mean, it's hard to parse out positives, but I think if you had to, one of them would be that a lot of eyes got open to the fact that, you know, there's a whole lot of corruption going on on every level here and a lot of coercion and a, a lot of really incestuous sort of relationship behavior that is not healthy between Washington and the pharmaceutical companies. And so, you know, if we don't fix that, we're essentially signing up for more of the same. I would ask you, do you think at this point the vaccines need to be pulled from market? Because I've talked to some cardiologists who have said affirmatively, absolutely, they feel like at this point any other product would have been pulled from the market. And they don't understand outside of psychological or political reasons why it has not happened. I absolutely agree. I think that it should be pulled from the market and, and until it's further studied. And that statement is is a, a bit difficult because discerning like, is that all those vaccines? Is it Moderna? Is it you know? Is it which which ones are we talking about? I think that that they should poll them and they should study them and then decide what's next. We're actually going the other direction, right? Where people are encouraging that we should continue to vaccinate yearly, or yeah, and take uh, more of them, and take more of them, and we still do not have the option of uh, not vaccinating in the healthcare industry, right? So we still are required to get uh, vaccinations of both COVID and flu. So the it, it, it's, to me, it, it's very uh, interesting that like, we have this whole question out there and yet we're pushing so far forward uh, in such a fast pace, like why? Why is that yeah. happening? Well, I talked to Pardon? a doctor earlier who said on a personal level, it's unnerving for them because they don't want to get the vaccine. They haven't wanted to get it, but they have gotten it. And that they're seeing so many problems in patients that they can't help but wonder on a regular basis if they're just waiting for a problem to happen to them, you know? And I thought about that, and that, that's got to be a really difficult thing to to deal with, you know, and I, I doubt that person is alone. I think that there's probably more people who feel 
a similar way. I guess I'm curious in, in your industry with, you know, among nurses and other doctors, is there discussion about this or are you guys talking about the vaccine side effects you're seeing every adverse event or are you talking about it in any way? Uh, there are many physicians talking about it. There are many nurses talking about it. There are many people that are unwilling uh, uh, to get vaccinated and um, go forward with uh, putting their, their own health at risk. And so I think the next question is, how, how do I move forward to be brave enough to speak out, to try to help people and tread in the area of where people are saying like, you're a bad person or you don't know the science or you are crazy or all these other things. But I think that we, we all have to understand that if we follow our, our altruism and we really follow our oath of first do no harm, we have to be brave enough if we have information to say, look, I'm seeing something here that's not right. Uh, I, I have to tell, tell people I have to talk about it because it's just not right. These poor patients that are coming in are not in the same boat I am. They don't have the ability to, to see broadly multiple people and discern it, right? So they're relying on me to be honest uh, about what I see. And I have to be as honest as I can be and just say, you know, I don't know, but I'm certainly seeing things. You yeah. asked me earlier what types of things I was saying and, and seeing. And a lot of cardiologists talk about cardiomyopathy. I have seen a lot of heart problems, but the issues that I'm seeing with heart are this episodically high blood pressure, like that just starts, but they talk about how POTS syndrome can be associated with this, which is orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. But I actually see not only that, but I see this hypertensive, like pe people I've cared for for 15 to 20 years, never had a problem. And then all of a sudden their blood pressure is out of control. And two of them had heart attacks without really cholesterol placking on, on catheterization. Wow. Why aren't these things being investigated and then talked about and how do we go about you know is it, it, it if my only way to do this is to to put up a VAERS registry where does that go what does it do and what do I do next and if I do try to help am I going to lose my job I would say I probably will lose my job if I continue to push the issue man oh, yeah. no I mean that's something I've heard consistently is people feeling that that's the case and in terms of what you said about VAERS I mean you make a great point in terms of what is happening as a, as a result of this data? And honestly, very little is happening. I mean, there's there's no accountability, it seems like. And when you look at, you know, people getting even a monetary sort of, it's not even a compensation of some form for the injury they've gone through. I mean, that's not even happening. People aren't getting paid when they are injured. We've seen zero dollars come out of the main fund so far. I think um, seven cases have been approved, but no money actually paid out. And out of the entire country and all the injuries that are being seen, that seems unconscionable to me, especially given the fact that we forced people to get this. And, right. you know, I, I think people are learning lessons for the future, though. And it's my hope that the lessons we've learned throughout COVID will prevent a second type of event like this. And, you know, I'm not sure that's the case, but that's my hope at least. And that's my, my prayer, I guess, at the end of every day is that we have learned enough to prevent this from happening a second time. But, you know, I'm consistently confronted with the reality that there's just a lot of moving pieces that don't have the same altruistic interests that, you yeah. know, maybe myself or, or you do. And um, that's that's always hard to stomach, but it's, it's true. And um, well, I think you've seen that, right? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think power and greed is is what is really at stake here. Power, money. Uh, this, this has to do with a lot more than a viral illness. And people um, are really going to need to be brave. So people are going to need to experience some discomfort. They're going to need to experience like this uh, this resiliency to say, this is what I believe in. And it's important enough that I may lose my job. It is important enough that I may lose some friends. It's important enough uh, because I have to be the type of person that is brave and goes forward and says, something's not right here and I have to be uh, brave enough to do it. And until we have enough people that do that, um, it's not gonna it's not gonna go in the right direction. Yep. And that's, that's exactly what I, I've been saying from the rooftops is that there's no more dangerous thing than being part of a silent majority because you allow a very loud 
usually extremist group of people to run everything and you've just been bullied into silence and you don't even realize you're the majority anymore and that's a scary thing and it leads to a scary place and so i really hope that people take to heart what you said we have a saying in medicine um especially in the er and critical situations we say no decision is a decision it means that if you are paralyzed in a situation that's critical and you make no decision, you have made a decision for the patient. And I would say that we are at that point in our uh, situation right now. No decision. If you want to make no decision to speak up for your patient, if you want to make no decision to tell them that there's a risk associated with this, if you want to make no decision to advocate for them, then you have made your decision, which is that you're a coward and you're going to stand behind and and watch people potentially get hurt. Well, I'm glad that for your patients, at least, that you're their doctor and you're looking out for them. I just hope that we we have more doctors like you enough to make some good decisions in, you know, the future here. My other fear is that, you know, a lot of this sort of DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion stuff has uh, in, infiltrated a lot of the medical community to a degree that they're slowly but surely trying to get rid of people who aren't willing to conform to the group think, I think is the nicest way to say it. Um, and it's a lot uglier than that, but I think that's the nicest way I could put it. And I wonder, do you see that? Yeah, I would give you an example of that, um, that people may not even understand. Say you're a young person and you need to do some type of job shadowing. The current uh, situation with that is that you can't job shadow if you don't get a COVID-19 vaccine. Okay, so if you don't get a COVID-19 vaccine, you can't job shadow. Therefore, you can't get into dental school, med school, nursing school. You can't get into your education if you don't have on your resume that you've done job shadowing. So guess what? Your whole conservative group of people that won't fall into line are not going to be able to be in this field. What's going to happen then? Yeah, it's a, it's a scary that's a scary prospect, you know, and that's that's without even looking at you know, how some of these organizations on a larger scale that deal with the licensing and everything else, how they're right. operating. And uh, that's that's a whole other scary sort of prospect. But I think that, you know, I'm not sure how you prevent this once an entire industry has begun to be pulled out from under us in this way, you know, where, where an entire ideological group is essentially taken hold with such prevalence. I mean, what do you do? I have thought about that a lot, and I'm not sure that I have a solution uh, for that. I think that not only related to COVID, but related to a lot of other things going on in the, the larger world right now, you need to pull back to the basics of depending on your your most basic group of people. Who do you talk to? How do you communicate? Um, who do you trust? Who do you work with? So you put your money where your mouth is. You don't support things that you don't agree with. Yeah. You know, and so if that means that you pay a little bit more at your local grocery instead of big box stores, you do it. If that means that somebody doesn't hold a value that's consistent with yours, you, you don't support that. And we're going to have to like actually form. Follow through. Um, yeah, we're going to have to follow through with our beliefs. Yep. This has been a, this has been a big priority for my wife and I this year is we want to get everybody is divorced from this system of, you know, the reality that's been built for so long that you have to go to all these big box places, you have to do all this stuff. We have to have our own parallel economy, essentially, that's, that's right. able to operate freely without the ability for these companies to cancel you or destroy your life in any way. And also it creates job opportunities and the ability to raise up, you know, new new sorts of groups that are willing to, you know, maybe think outside the box. Now, my yeah. last question for you is that as you look ahead, what do you think is the most important lesson that people learn from what's happened with COVID? I think that the most important lesson is a lesson that I learned even before this, which is everything is a slippery slope. So if you allow any give at the beginning, it will get worse and worse and worse. So when somebody says, well, we just need to do this for a short period of time, and you don't say, no, we're not doing that then you're going to actually end up in a position uh, where there's just a, an erosion further and further and further. So the time to stand up and speak is at the beginning. It's not at the end. You don't wait until don't somebody. Wait until That's right. No, nope. you've got to speak up right in the beginning and say, no, I don't agree with this. We're not doing it this way. 
imagine where we'd be right now had everybody who actually disagreed with this stood up uniformly and said that from the very start. Um, but again, that's the psychological side of this that convinced people they were actually not in the majority when in fact they were. So I lied a little bit. I actually have one last, last question. Legislatively, is there anything that would help doctors like you to protect your ability to do your job and speak freely? Is there anything that I could do to push to lawmakers to try to get a little more freedom and autonomy for doctors to be able to question the science and question, you know, what's going on? Is there anything along those lines that would be helpful? Man, that is a incredibly great question and something that um, I've been so focused on the very lowest level of working directly with the patient. Um, and, and I've been working so hard on trying to figure out how to test for things and how to get them the help they need that I have not really stepped back and think about the, to st think about that. But clearly, that is actually where we need to go with this, is to protect the autonomy and rights of, of individual physicians from employers, organizations, board certifications. Yes. I think that there, there are some alternative board certifications coming up that we need some of the industry to acknowledge. And if we can get acknowledgement that this has become a self-like fulfilling prophecy from you fall into line or you, you know, now there's a physician code of conduct, which sounds like it would be a wonderful thing, right? That sounds like that is very reasonable. But if you look at the fine print on it, it means that if you push back, if you want to practice something novel, all these things, you can be, you can have your livelihood taken away. Everything. So, yes. So absolutely. I think that we need to have individuals who are really forward thinking sit down with people who understand the laws and understand the legislature and understand these things and say, what do you need? Here's how we can accomplish it. And we need to form those groups, just like we just talked about before, where it takes a small group of people that make a big change. We need to Absolutely. put the right people in the right places to institute change. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. And if you do come up with any sort of legislative idea, let me know. You have my uh, information now. And uh, I'd be happy to help try to push this through legislatures all over the country. We've had some great success with other bills for other subjects. And it's something I've been thinking about. And I don't quite have exactly the answer, which is why I haven't really presented it to anybody yet. But I know this is a problem. And the way I kind of posed the question to you is how I've been thinking about it, that how do you protect the autonomy of doctors um, on, on these subjects while also ensuring that, you know, it doesn't also protect somebody who goes crazy, you know, or something along those lines, right. you know, if right. somebody says, oh, well, I, I think it's medically necessary to stab patients, you know, I mean, you've right. got to draw a line somewhere. So yeah, I'm right. trying to figure that out and parse that out. But if you come up with anything that would be legislatively helpful, you know, please reach out and tell me because I, I want to help be a part of the change for this to ensure it doesn't happen again. We couldn't do this show without our great sponsor, Patriot Mobile. If you haven't heard about Patriot Mobile, they are the cell phone service for you. Get away from the big companies. You keep your cell phone number. You keep your phone. Don't worry about it. It's not a hassle. It's quick to switch over and you stop giving your money to woke corporations who want to do nothing but take your money and turn it over to far left Marxist groups. Patriot Mobile puts their money where their mouth is. They help flip school board seats and put their money into conservative projects like this one so that they support the values that we believe in. You need to switch over today. If you care about your values, it's time for us to put our money where our mouth is. And Patriot Mobile is one of the ways you can do that by switching over. Their service standards are the exact same as all the major providers out there. So don't tell me, oh, I would do it, but I'm worried about bad service. It is the same service standards that the big ones are required to abide by. It is fantastic. It is worth the switch. Make it today. You get free activation. PatriotMobile.com slash Starbuck. Just say Starbuck and you get that free activation for your phone lines. You will not regret it. And you'll be very pleased to find out that the money from your phone bill is now going toward projects and values that you believe in. We also spoke to a patient advocate, and again, we granted anonymity for the same purpose that we did with the doctor, EMT, and nurses, because we wanted to get the real unfiltered truth about what happened during COVID without any fear of reprisal or losing their job. So we're going to dive right in. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ravi. 
So I just want to ask you right off the bat, you know, how did COVID change your workplace? How did it change the experience for your patients? As a patient advocate, you're always looking out for their best interests. How did everything change? Well, yeah, let me start off just by saying, um, just to clarify, I'm not giving any medical advice. I really want people to find somebody who's invested in their wellness and takes the time to get to know them personally. Um, so be looking for those things if you're looking for a practitioner. But just as far as my experience on the COVID units, the whole the whole experience had changed as far as interaction, as you can imagine, being masked, being away from family. Right now, I currently work as a patient advocate. The primary advocate has always been the family member at the bedside. So they've always been the one driving the questions, helping staff notice uh, like slight differences that maybe we wouldn't pick up on because we don't know them. We don't know their baseline. So families play a huge role in alerting nurses and doctors if something's changing or if something's wrong. And so when you take away that relationship that we have, not only with the family, but with the patient themselves, it, it was just a, a really dramatic difference for me to witness. And, you know, you touched on something there that I think, you know, we could expand on, you know, it essentially became an environment where patients no longer had the dignity of having their families around. And in some cases, that is still sadly the case, even in the United States of America, where family members are being held back from being with their loved ones, even as they die. You know, what was that like as a patient advocate? And how was it for patients that you saw that, that, that were going through this? Well, it was incredibly sad, especially to watch as a nurse, because that's that's what I that's my primary go to is um, making sure that the family is, is there, they're available, that the goodbyes are said. Um, a lot of times in the dying process, we get a window. There's a window where they come back. You know, they might have been sleepy, not communicative. And all of a sudden we get this beautiful window in the dying process where they'll come back. And if the family isn't there, we don't know how long it lasts. We don't know when it's going to happen. And if the family isn't there at that time, I just feel like precious moments were missed for people to die with their loved ones by their side. And even to have, you know, clergy come in to have the rights, final rights administered. A lot of times that wasn't happening, too. Now, tell me this. You know, in your experience, and again, you know, I've stressed throughout this this whole thing with every interview we've done, that these are the anecdotal experiences of these these people, and, you know, it gives us a window into what some people have experienced. But in your opinion, you know, what kind of differences did you see when the vaccine started to roll out in terms of outcomes for vaccinated versus unvaccinated patients? So it was something that um, it troubled me so much that it was, I wasn't sure I could withstand it to be there as a witness to it. But I was working the first few months of that vaccine rollout. And um, the facility that I was working at, they were actually administering the vaccines. So we got to hear overhead when there were problems going on. And it, the calls overhead were emergency calls to go to the vaccine clinic site. So that, that worried a lot of the staff. And we had questions and there were meetings about that. There is a lot going on just as far, even as the experience of my coworkers, that they were complaining of having side effects to the point where notices went out saying, you cannot have the vaccine unless it winds up with your days off because you're going to need so much time off to recover. It's never happened. It's never happened. So, and has and there ever been a push quite like this for any other vaccine within within the medical industry in terms of like the... You know, really, it, it built this this bridge, or bridge is maybe the wrong word. It built this this environment, we'll say, where it really cut people into multiple different groups of you know people who should be humanized and people who should be dehumanized. And I think that is one of the most dangerous things, and continues to be one of the most dangerous things, is how people who chose not to get it were dehumanized. Right, right. That's huge, and it's a it's a big scary thing because. You know, I think a lot of what's been going on with the medical community is they've been propagandized in a certain way to devalue the person either who has the contagion, the disease, or people who potentially would be spreaders, which to them would be the unvaccinated. So both of these people are discriminated against. Which and is interesting because now we're seeing science showing that, you know, in, in many places, the more vaccinated you are, the more likely you are to end up in the hospital with COVID. And that's something that 
I think has shocked a lot of people who maybe truly did believe the lines that were being fed to them by the CDC and thought they were doing the right thing. Because we've heard from these people too. I've had some folks reach out who said, listen, I thought from the very beginning, CDC was being honest about this. I got it myself. I even got boosted. And you know now I'm dealing with the outcome of that personally, but also the guilt of having gone and relayed this message from the CDC to people believing it was the truth and not knowing how many people it has now affected. What can you tell me in terms of, you know, that sort of thought process, you know, playing out? I can't relate to that so much just because I don't subscribe to the vaccines personally, but I do, I have seen that push over the years. It started with the flu shot actually, um, where it was, do you want to get it? Do not, we'll offer it to you from the employer. And slowly it became, okay, you need to sign a declination. Well, I would say, I don't want to sign the declination. Like, what are the repercussions for not signing a declination? None. Okay, so then I wouldn't do that. Then years went by of that. And then it was finally, okay, if you don't do this, then you're going to have to wear a mask. And the compliance went way up when they were threatening to mask people. This is pre-COVID for the flu shot. Um, What year was that? This was, it was 2019, and a lot of nurses that I knew that I had talked to about the dangers of the flu shot, they were, they were in the pattern of declining, and they accepted it in 2019. Wow. People had horrible experiences with COVID. Um, so I'm, I think that that was kind of a predisposition, you know, it sort of primed their immune system that we've seen. Some people who got the flu shot were more prone to severe COVID. Well, all I can say is, you know, I've told people pretty much my whole life, um, I've never gotten the flu shot and I've also not gotten the flu. (laughs) So, you know, and everybody I know, and this is just my anecdotal experience. I can't say that this is the absolute truth or anything, just my own life experience. Pretty much everybody I know who gets the flu shot then complains to me about how they got the flu. And it's always blown my mind. And I always bring it up to them. I'm like, I don't get it. You got the flu shot and then you got the flu. Why? And every year they're like, oh, it was a poor match. Well, what year has it been a good match, you guys? That's what I always ask because, you know, I, I've looked yeah. into the data too where they even admit in later years, okay, last year wasn't a match, last year wasn't a match. And I'm like, when is it a match, guys? It's, you know, not, it's not been a great match for many years. And what's interesting now is when I'm offered contracts, well, not that I'm being offered any, but if I, you know, if I poke the bear a little bit, I'm like, okay, how much are you guys willing to pay? Will you accept me with religious exemption? And they'll say, well, we're accepting for COVID, but now they're not accepting for the flu. Wow. So it's interesting how that flu shot has come back again. <laughs> and it's because they know they've gotten in a lot of legal trouble. For... Well, they're trying to force compliance in any way they can. You know, right. this is something I've talked about a lot too, just in terms of religious liberty. I do think it's really interesting that a bunch of secular institutions have decided that they're now the arbiters of what your religious beliefs mean. And that's dangerous. I mean, you talk about already them stopping people from being able to get their last rights in some cases. Then you're also unilaterally deciding what each nurse and each doctor believes religiously. I mean, how many ways can that go wrong? Right, right, exactly. This is the start of a very dangerous road if anybody is willing to accept this on a large scale because the minute they can question this religious belief, well, then they can go and question your other religious beliefs. So say you're an OB who doesn't want to take part in abortions. Well, what if the hospital says, oh, you're fired if you don't because we don't care about your religious belief? And that's neither here nor there, whether you support it or not. It's just a clear fundamental reality of religious freedom. Should a doctor be forced to do something that they don't agree with or a nurse be forced to take part in a procedure they don't agree with? I don't think they should. It's kind of the same thing as a pharmacist where, you know, this has been something that's been litigated for years. Should they be required to dispense a medication that they feel is in opposition to their religion? And the answer has always been no. They just need to provide somebody else who can dispense, but that no corporation or workplace should have the ability to force you to go do something that you feel is in direct violation of your religious beliefs. You know, so that's something that I think we really need to to get a handle on. But, you know, do you feel like COVID in any way increased medical neglect? Oh, I do. Definitely. Absolutely. Especially in terms that the staff were scared. They were really scared. Um, So they weren't spending that much time in patient rooms. 
they're also all the the PPE, the mask, you know, you have to wear full garments going in. So that's very cumbersome, especially going in and out often. So, you know, it's part part of it is I don't want to say laziness, but it's like it is very cumbersome part of the job. Um, I broke my glass. I had prescription glasses. Like it's so heavy, it broke my prescription glasses. In addition to that, it was really the lack of tools. It was almost a, a poverty mindset where we were in this. It's like a spiritual, like soup of nihilism, where it's you know whatever happens happens. It's COVID. You know they're destined to die. And it didn't necessarily have to be that way because we had a whole bunch of tools in our hands. So yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a traveler. So one of the units I was on, it turned out that they were putting in central monitoring right as I was coming on. And this was a year into COVID. And what that means is p- like patients were put in the back without proper monitoring of their oxygen levels and of their heart. And a couple of patients had expired alone and nobody knew about it till they found him dead so that's what it took it takes people dying in order for changes to happen yeah. and that's that's the sad part is that there were casualties to covid so it was beyond neglect it was it was neglect that led to death i mean unfortunately i think you're actually right on that point you know i will ask this in my life my life experience has been that when you have a family member or a loved one in a hospital and there's some sort of crisis, there's been situations where I know for a fact having a family member there has saved somebody's life because they've been able to relay really important information to the doctor, to the nurses, or they've been able to observe something that may have been missed by doctors or nurses. Right. So, you know, I even know of a case, you know, personally, where there had been somebody who said something in the patient's care. I'm not going to single it out or, you know, call the person out, but it, it it was somebody involved in the care. They relayed something that was not true that could have actually really hurt the patient. And had there not been a family member there to have caught that and immediately notified somebody else involved in the patient's care, things could have gone horribly wrong. And I'm curious, throughout COVID and the new protocols that were put in place, did you see or witness an environment where this sort of thing becomes more likely because it opens up the ability when family's far away and they're not there to observe everything? Number one, it can hurt the patient just right off the bat by not having somebody there who can observe things, you know, really easily. But secondarily, even allow an environment where people who mess up can cover it up by lying. Right. Yeah, and that's that's part of that. Well, it's COVID and it's a nihilistic mindset. But on top of that, I did see a few things that were concerning. It was it was medical mismanagement is the term I use because it was things that I could see how it would appear as COVID, but it wasn't COVID. And these people were very acutely ill and they needed a different treatment. But because these COVID blinders were on, they weren't offered a proper differential diagnosis. Because there was that fear. Time wasn't spent with them. I, it was my first training day, and I was trying to figure out how to call a doctor. And they're like, oh, no, the doctors don't come to the COVID unit. And I'm like, what? <laughs> That's ridiculous. The doctor's not going to come. I'm like, I have a patient that I'm watching die. And I sent the labs. I'm calling the physician. Finally got a hold of them. And they said, well, those labs aren't compatible with life. And I said, well, you need to come up here to the bedside because this person is very much alive. And if we don't intervene immediately, they may not be. So it was that type of medical mismanagement. It was somebody who they had tested positive for COVID, but they were actually in a diabetic crisis. Wow. So it was her blood sugars that needed to be treated. And that's why she was going into respiratory arrest. And she was, I mean, like her labs, they weren't compatible with that. She was on the cusp. But she is somebody who made it hit by the grace of God. It was really an amazing story. But um, yeah, that was my first day of the COVID unit. Uh, no doctors around. You don't know how to get a hold of them. Apparently, they don't come to the floor. You have to text them. Um, it was so bizarre. It's I'm like, is this what medicine is? It's it was real. What can you tell us about the incentive that hospitals have to mark deaths as a COVID death? Okay, so there is huge financial incentive towards that. 
And this is what, there's a whole broader picture here that I call, it's the socialization of medicine. This is what social, socialized medicine is. And first of all, you alter the power structure where um, you call these people heroes. And I don't like that term. And I saw early on, we were, I was talking with a Christian friend of mine. She's like, this could go badly. This could go the wrong way. I know it sounds favorable now, but it's increasing that, that different power structure. And then you add masks. And then you add this feeling of that you're a hero again if you get vaccinated. Um, so it's like the, the power is so far off that it's hard to equalize again and give the patient back power and autonomy. Um, especially when you have this whole organization and it's not just the doctors and nurses, it's structured from the government. Then you have pay incentives that are happening. They've also, they, a lot of these states have signed on so that they don't have liability. The doctors don't have liability for prescribing these protocols and neither do the nurses. But in some cases in California, they're suing over remdesivir because they didn't give proper informed consent. So there's there's ways out of that liability. Oh, I want to stop you there on it on informed consent. That yes. is a huge, huge issue. Probably close to the top issue, if not the top issue, that I've had the biggest problem with when it comes to the vaccine. How often do you think patients are given informed consent about what they're actually getting put into their body? Oh gosh, I want to say close to never. That sounds terrible. But I mean, as far as, as far as going through the side effects, I'm a Christian and it's like, why did I have to research so much? Like, why did I have to deep dive to find out that there's aborted fetal material in vaccines, that it's part of the manufacturing process, is part of the history of these vaccines? Like, and it's, it's also in medical products. Um, there's a lot of questions about the blood supply, about IVIG. So it's something that I think not only are practitioners bound by, but at some point we got to get the religiously conscious people on board too, meaning past, and I've heard it more from pastors and priests, but it's like, they have to get the word out too, to their congregants. And I think a lot of them did just the opposite. They started vaccine clinics. And I think there was financial incentive for them to do that too. Absolutely. You know, another thing I would say that you sort of started to touch on is that power dynamic that has become even more dangerous because that whole idea and the narrative that, you know, basically science and doctors could not be questioned has led to a pervasive growth in the power dynamic that is already weighted against the patient. And so, you know, what can you tell me about the environment there was or is still today for patients who just want to ask questions? Are questions allowed? No, <laughs> no, questions are not allowed. And that's that's primary. How, that's how I get a lot of um, people who reach out to me for help is mostly it's for data capture because they either they a don't know the right questions or they're asking questions and getting answers that they don't like or that they're still not sure the picture of what's going on with their loved one, especially if they're not at the bedside. That's where my role was really key, was trying to decipher what's going on, even sitting on the phone um, with nurses giving report to the family, because a lot of times they won't talk to me. They don't want to talk to me. But a lot of it is data capture and then informing the family of what their rights are, gathering them resources, helping to research, and then helping them execute a game plan. You know, this is what, what would your loved one want? What is it that you want to do? And this is how we can try to enforce that as kind, as kindly as possible, because it's, I mean, we've had some bizarre reactions from doctors where they, you know, they refuse to treat, they, they refuse to transfer patients. They refuse to um, carry out family wishes, try alternative methods, uh, refuse right to try. It's become so basic. They're actually refusing them food and water. Unbelievable. It's patients that aren't, they are not ventilated. They're actually laying in the bed asking, saying, I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. Unbelievable. And they're, they're denied that right. When you bring up refusal, one thing that I feel like was incredibly dangerous that grew again throughout COVID was the idea that hospitals and doctors just unilaterally deny all patient requests and all of their family requests. What can you tell me about that? Did you see that happening? 
And why was it happening? Was there any discussion behind the scenes in terms of saying like, oh, we're just not going to listen to anything families request about their loved one's care? Because I saw this myself where, you know, somebody I know, their uh, mom went into the hospital and was put on remdesivir against the family's wishes. They wanted her put on something else and the hospital refused to put her on something else and put her on remdesivir anyways. And then she died. Yeah. And that we've seen that happen too. And it's, um, I mean, at that point we've had to get legal. It's, you have to get legal involved. You have to get, yeah, you have to get judgments that, you know, alternative doctors we have to get our own doctors to go in our own nurses to go in to administer different medications um and even doctors that were willing some of them have been immediately fired if they've been off protocol because then they're not there then the hospital isn't under that liability shield yeah there's there's just a blanket response of no and even i have i have a sub stack that i got an email this morning from american frontline nurses and it was a family member saying, asking for the remdesivir to come off. She's like, I did my research. I don't feel comfortable with it. And they said, well, it's just another few days. And it's there's a time when no means no. Patients yeah. will write to say no. And we know that the longer that remdesivir goes, the more complications people have. And they usually want to start it off 24 hours. So as soon as somebody hits the ER, that's when this time starts ticking. And it's, it's really imperative to say no every single time, any person you're talking to, any person, any nurse, any, the pharmacist, put it as an allergy, put it as a, I'm allergic to remdesivir. It's on my allergy list. Don't, if I get it, uh, I'll have a really bad reaction. My kidneys will fail. I could possibly die. So that's on my allergy list. There's a game you've got to play. There's, and that's what it's come to is. You got to be in them at their own game because if you would have a reaction, if you go into kidney failure, then they're liable because they didn't, you ask them, they, anytime you give a medication, you have to ask what the allergies are. It's one of the rights of medication of what we learn in school. You have cert, they have certain rights to make sure they get the right medication at the right time for the right person. So if there's an allergy, that's immediate stop for the pharmacist, for the nurse and for the doctor. Yeah. What do you know in terms of your own experience, but also your colleagues' experience when it comes to side effects from the COVID vaccine? What types of side effects are they seeing in hospitals right now? Um, right now, what we're hearing a lot of is the cardiac. There's cardiac issues, especially among the younger. We're hearing that from family members of teenagers, kids that are needing it for college. You know, they're trying They're trying to not get it for whatever reason. And then, you know, it's like the college requires it or it's required to go on this, you know, international trip or a cruise. Um, so people are, they're getting it to keep participating in life, <laughs> things that they're entitled to do anyways. That's the most triggering, I think, because cardiac issues, it's not really a nuance in, in people that are middle-aged and older, especially for men. I mean, that's not something you'd necessarily look at as like, that's an oddball, but when it's happening to children, that's concerning. So it's, yeah, it's the children that are the, the red flags. Yeah. And how pervasive would you say it was? Cause I, I've heard this throughout interviews with everybody. How pervasive was the use of fake vaccine cards by people who didn't want to get it, but said, Hey, I'm going to procure this on the side because I don't want to lose my job. Did you hear about anybody doing this? I did. I didn't personally know anybody that did that. I think when it came to that enforcement is most of the people I knew caved. Like they were staunchly against it. They could go through the whole narrative and, you know, they would say this is a bioweapon. Um, I don't believe in all the death stats and you know, the, the media is really exaggerating the sequela of COVID and who's affected by it. So it's like they knew all the stats and they said the right things, but in the end, they caved. That's, I I know of a few people who have them, but they're not employed. <laughs> so it's, it's like when it came to either, either they said no and they don't have jobs or, you know, they caved and they got the shot. And a lot of them have remorse now after getting that, especially seeing what's going on with the side effects. All right, last two questions. Uh, one is, what could have prevented this all from happening? And the other is, 
what do we need to do differently in the future, in your opinion, to make sure that this type of power imbalance and really, frankly, evil in some cases does not continue to play out in medicine? Ooh, yeah. So how could it have been prevented? For me, that's really easy. It's it's knowing history, knowing, you know, what happened during the Holocaust. And as it be, today is Holocaust Remembrance Day. It's January 27th. So knowing that the anthem of that is never again, we do not want this to happen again. And what came out of the Holocaust was we had the Nuremberg Laws, which was saying that you have to give informed consent. And it can't be, it can't be consent under coercion or duress. And the majority of people that I know, they were coerced into taking those vaccines. Or, and also remdesivir and the monoclonal antibodies. So it, it was all encompassing. And it was this, it was a war over people's minds. It was a propaganda war. It's like, if we had known our history, there's actually a really good movie called Caring Corrupted. It's about the killing nurses of the Third Reich and just kind of that slow boil of how they became fully on board with the execution of Jewish people, six million Jewish people perish. Um, and that couldn't have, it wouldn't have been possible without nurses and physicians. They're the ones that carried it out. So it's it's really incredible to think about the Jewish people were also medically experimented on. So it's terrifying to think that history would repeat itself. Well, there's one other component, too, that's very important in terms of, you know, how that all happened then and something a parallel to what we're seeing now. I mean, obviously, you know, the death numbers are not the same and things like that, but it's just in right. terms of spelling out how in history we see evil perpetuated with similar tools and in similar ways, you know, a silent majority that was silent was a big part of the problem because everybody who disagreed in Germany was afraid to speak out. And at a certain point, it was too late to speak out unless you too wanted to end up on the wrong side of the authoritarian tyrant dictators that were murdering people. And so that fear to speak out is incredibly dangerous. If you don't do it early and speak out, eventually you may not be able to. And at a certain point, you realize that in some ways you, you're complicit with what happens as a result of that silence. And so I think that that's something I warn people about a lot is that, you know, we can't be afraid to speak up because if we are, this is sort of a submission in itself, even if we don't submit in ways that we think are really important. This is a form of submitting if we're afraid to just talk about things. And so, you know, I, I appreciate the the parallel you're drawing in there. And, you know, some people jump on this and say you should never compare anything to the Holocaust. And the truth is, is that some Holocaust survivors have brought this up throughout COVID. And it's not to compare atrocities it's not to say something's as bad as the Holocaust. It's to say that, listen, you know, part of the way you ensure that the Holocaust never happens again, that atrocities that are similarly devastating never happen, is by speaking up and making sure people remember history. And that's why some Holocaust survivors have spoken out and said, you know, a lot of these things are scarily reminiscent in terms of what allowed the Holocaust to occur? That doesn't mean that, you know, that's the eventuality next, but it just means that these are dangerous signals, dangerous symptoms of a very, very, very toxic poison. And, you know, I think that's something people need, do need to hear that, you know, we've, we've got to ensure that if we truly never want something like that to happen again, then we have a responsibility to stand up when we see things going the wrong direction. You agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I do. There's the comparison to the Holocaust, but there's also just the history of vaccines in general, where we've seen this pervasive problem of it's really not even abortion because they they take these babies and they rip out their organs while they're still alive. So this is murder that's happened, and there's a whole lot of ethical implications. And I'm talking about the research and development, correct? Yeah, the research of, and development. Most of this, what I've learned is through Dr. Stanley Plotkin, through the testimony, the 2018 testimony, where he was under oath talking about how these vaccines were initially created. So if, if we would have said, no, we don't want these, they have ethical alternatives. So we, we could have pushed the pharmaceutical company into saying, no, we don't want these. We want liability. That would be great. That'd be great if you guys were liable and made safe products. That'd be huge. 
Well, I mean, but, I, I'll never understand that. The idea that these companies should not be liable, it's its ludicrous. If I went out and I created a car in my garage and I decided to sell it to somebody and it blew up, I'd be liable for it because, number one, I was not qualified to build a car. But number two, if the product that I made went and, and just spontaneously combusted, that's on me. I, I was responsible right. for that, you know, and I think that it's just ludicrous to tell big pharmaceutical companies that they're different somehow. Yeah, they're totally immune. And it's not it's not just the EUA products. It goes all the way back to 1986. All those products since then, um, there's total shield immunity. So I think if we would have pushed them to make more ethical products and then push for liability, we would not, was not, would not be. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Transparency is missing. Mm-hmm. And I'm a big believer that we need to immediately ban members of the government from leaving government and going to be employed at big pharmaceutical companies and their family members. So if you want to go and you want to be a part of the government, you want to go join the FDA, you are never going to be able to work at a pharmaceutical company. And neither is your wife or your son or your daughter, because that's how you get into extremely dangerous territory. And we saw this in the Pfizer videos that were just released by Project Veritas, where the Ooh. Pfizer employee yeah. says that, yeah, there's there's a dangerous you know sort of system where the people from the FDA come over to the pharmaceutical companies. So as a byproduct, if they want to come here, they know they have to go soft on us. And you know, the Project Veritas person on the other side says, well, you know, that's got to be good for business. And he says, yeah, it's great for business, bad for America. And the Pfizer employee knows that this is bad for America. And he wasn't saying this to warn anybody. He was saying this gloating in, in the in the idea he was on a date. He was proud of this. And that's what's, you know, just really incredibly dangerous. If we continue this pipeline of allowing people to go to the FDA go soft on big pharma and then get a huge payout by big pharma a couple of years later, that's just crazy. I mean, it honestly, it seems like a mafia. And so I think that's something we immediately have to cut out. Yeah. Yeah. We need to address the the government corruption and also the buy dole act, which says that, you know, they can't, they use taxpayer money and they develop these patents that they enrich themselves with. Yep. And then they charge the American taxpayer on top of that. What's so, happening right now with the vaccines? I mean, the American public paid for the development of the vaccines. And then now, you know, Moderna just announced they're going to be charging over $130 each vaccine when it costs $3 to produce. And the American public funded the creation of the vaccine. That in itself is just crazy town. It's basically the worst, most bizarre version of socialized communist medicine you could imagine. You're paying for it, but you're paying for it twice. And they're marking it up the second time. That just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, that's that's how medicine works. <laughs> it has for a long time with insurers. And yeah. It's... Well, you know, I am hopeful I see new systems forming. You know, there's some I'm involved with. There's one that's, you know, concierge medicine service. I think that's kind of the future of medicine where, you know, it you is. go back to sort of the old times of, you know, doctor drops by your house, checks in on you, sees how you're doing, checks your vitals, you know, uh, maybe is actually involved in your nutrition and and making sure you have the vitamins you need and everything more of a family oriented aspect of, of medicine rather than the you know sort of i mean i don't have a nice way to put it it's almost like a like an animal shelter when you go to a, a regular doctor's office like they're they're funneling the people in and out like they're you know a dog that needs to get their vaccines and it's like yeah. shut up you just need your shots you're going back in the cage you know yeah. and it, it's just i mean it's Honestly, I think it's ludicrous in the in the animal hospital, but it's even more ludicrous on human beings that, you know, you just pump them in and out as fast as you can. That's not care. That's not good medicine, in my opinion. And I don't think that's upholding the oath of doing no harm either, because it leads to the outcomes we have now where people can't question things. They end up with a medicine they didn't know had serious side effects and maybe end up with a cardiac issue or, you know, have extreme blood clotting. You know, there's all kinds of outcomes we hear about, and some of them, you know, maybe more benign, you know, but they're still troubling to people like, let's say, you know, Bell's palsy. You know, if you have partial facial paralysis, that can be really difficult to go through. And a doctor, I've seen doctors do this. They they almost make it seem like it's no big deal. And like, oh, it'll go away. Don't worry about it. And it's like, yeah, people are going to worry about that. That's That's a very serious life altering situation that most people don't suspect is going to occur as a byproduct of getting this when they're not told ahead of time 
that it is a possibility. And I think that it says everything that we don't have informed consent because the truth is, number one, many doctors don't even have informed consent themselves. They couldn't answer the questions if you asked them. But number two, if you gave informed consent to most people, there's no chance they would get it. You know, most people are not going to be willing to go and take that risk if you tell them that, you know, hey, you could get a heart attack, you get blood clots, you get, you know, all these different syndromes, you could get Bell's palsy, you could have seizures, you go down the list. There's all of these side effects that everybody knows about now that nobody knew about in the beginning in terms of that informed consent. So, and we're still not getting it today, even though we know about it. Doctors still aren't telling people um, in many cases that these are possibilities. If you're a longtime follower or listener, you know I have talked about how broken our healthcare system is, and it is time for a solution. That's why I've partnered with the company Claris to bring you that solution. You want to go back to the old days where a doctor actually cared? They came to your house, they gave real service and healthcare to your family, not sick care, just waiting for you to get sick? That's Claris. You can get a doctor that comes to you or telehealth, and you can get that service on a one-off basis. Don't deal with the insurance companies, just deal directly with them and get the healthcare you deserve. This again is an opportunity. If you're one of those people that says, I don't want a doctor who asks my kid about their pronouns. I don't want a doctor who's got propaganda in their waiting room. I don't want a doctor who tries to push a vaccine that I'm not comfortable with every time that I go into the doctor's office, then this is for you. They're expanding fast. The locations are gonna open nationwide at certain points in time in the future. So make sure you sign up, even if you're not in the areas I'm about to name, where they are already up and running. Right now, they're up and running in Knoxville, Nashville, and Franklin, Tennessee, and all the surrounding areas around those cities. So if you're in that area, they're ready to go right now. They're ready to see your family, and you get 10% off if you go to RobbieVIP.com to do your sign up. Same for if you're out of the area. You will get notified as soon as your area is up and running, wherever you are, and get that 10% off. So sign up today, RobbieVIP.com. That's R-O-B-B-Y-V-I-P.com. We've got another anonymous nurse that I wanted to bring in to discuss how she felt things changed during COVID and the effect that COVID or the vaccines have had on the public at large. So thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you. I just want to go right into it. You know, how did COVID change the industry you work in as a nurse and what did you see change most drastically? For me, it really just changed everything. I went into the pandemic with terrified and I think most people were believed all the hype, you know, was scared for, you know, to death for six months of like what I could bring home to my family, you know, what, you know, should I even be going out, seeing friends? And I, I mean, you know, we saw sick, sick people, you know, I'm not one of those people that think this was any sort of hopes by any means. Um, I took the precautions necessary right off the bat. Then as things started to, you know, progress and we found out, you know, that it was more so, you know, affecting the elderly or people that had comorbidities, I started to realize, you know, this isn't the national crisis or global crisis that it was being played out and then as that started I just started to question more like why aren't we letting people know to you know like right off the bat you know they're saying isolate you know stay by yourself for 10 days and I mean now looking back it's like that was the worst thing we could tell people like just to lay in bed and be sick I, I mean we should be getting out moving around the reason why people got so ill was because sure they had COVID, but then it progressed to pneumonia. How do you get pneumonia? You get pneumonia by not using your lung capacity. So laying in bed for 10 days away from society it is only going to make this problem worse. You know, um, in my mind that we were trying to convince people to go inside and stay inside and not go out in the sun, not go get exercise. I mean, really like the things that increase your comorbidities and your chances of getting seriously sick seem like exactly what we were telling people to do. Don't exercise. You know, gyms are bad. Stay inside, stay safe, you know, and in reality, people needed exercise to eat healthy to get out in the sun, stay active, you know, take all your vitamins, work on your immune system. I mean, I, it it blows my mind still to this day. We have never had a national conversation about how to boost your immune system throughout the entirety of this crazy, you know, let me ask you this. When, when COVID started, you know, and you guys are initially treating patients, how were they treating patients and did it change at all because of political reasons? So right off the bat, I mean, I, started 
in the very beginning of COVID. We had a COVID unit. I work in the ER. So right off the bat, we started to intubate patients, which we, at that point, we had, we didn't know. This was like week one or two. People were coming in with low oxygen saturation. There was nothing we could do to get them up. In my mind, I feel like at that point, sure, that's what we, we thought was best for the patient. And I have no like issues with that. Um, and then we started to learn more about the proning. So we started, you know, proning patients, which had some good results. So we started to veer away from the immediate intubations. And I saw that and, you know, doctors that I worked with were advocating for that. The thing that I thought was weird was we, beginning of the pandemic, we were giving hydroxychloroquine in the ER. Uh, we were told that if a patient tested positive, that we were to notify pharmacy and get the med on board as soon as possible. Uh, when that stopped, it stopped shortly after. Um, and then we got an email saying, you know, this isn't, doesn't have like the effects or the correct studies or, you know, so we will stop using that. And um, so did that, did they stop that after President Trump started to talk about it? Yeah, I would say, because that's when I, what that, like, to me, in my mind, that's when I paid attention to it. Like, it was a drug that I had never given before in the ER, so I didn't really, you know, make any note of it. And then all of a sudden, you start hearing, you know, it became like a buzzword. And then, yeah, it was it stopped being given. We know what's interesting is a lot of people started to demonize these drugs, whether it be ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine. And the reality is, is these have both been around for a very long time. One is the best antiparasitic in the world that's used and been used for a very long time, incredibly cheap, not something that is helpful to big pharma if it does, in fact, help this. Um, and the other hydroxychloroquine has been used forever with lupus patients. You know, I have somebody in my family who has lupus and they've taken hydroxychloroquine. And it's something that has been a lifesaver for a ton of people. And the idea that, you know, in the medical community, I mean, this was scary in the medical community and the science community. It very quickly turned into this environment where you're not allowed to ask questions and you're not allowed to do what science and medicine are supposed to do. And that's to try to find solutions. Yeah. Suddenly this new environment where hey, you're only allowed to find solutions that are in this very narrow lane. If you look outside of this lane, you're not only a science denier, but we're going to try to strip you of your license, which is, by the way, the reason why I have anonymous doctors, anonymous nurses, anonymous you know people in this industry coming forward and speaking under that anonymity is because they're afraid of losing their license. It's not because they're afraid to tell the truth with their face on camera. It's because they've been threatened and coerced into this idea that, hey, we're going to steal your livelihood if you don't stick into this narrow framework that you've been given. Is that a pretty accurate you know, description of how the, the people in the medical community who are not going along with this feel? Oh, 100%. I mean, like, it's becoming a little more now that things have been coming out. But for the past year, I just feel like I've had to live under a rock and I can't question any of this. And and there's like no thought process outside of this algorithm. And the algorithm wasn't working for so long. So why did we stick with and only yeah. this? Well, let me ask you a question. Once the vaccine was introduced and it started to become, you know, the, the norm in terms of, you know, in a lot of ways, they treated it like a treatment, which it's not supposed to be. But that's how it was treated as, as if it was a therapeutic. You know, how did you see things change? What 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 became, you know, really noticeable in terms of vaccinated patients versus unvaccinated patients? And how has that changed over time? What does that look like today? Where I work, they did they didn't make it mandatory at first. And um at that point I was still, you know, like, okay, I see COVID patients every day. Um I have, you know, high risk family members and I, I took it willingly. I didn't I wasn't coerced. I, would, I didn't feel threat, you know. And they said, you know, we will never mandate something that is not FDA approved. And then very quickly it became, you need to be vaccinated. And if not, you have to have a, a uh, an exemption. So either re religious or medical. Um, and I had coworkers that had horrible reactions to other vaccines and had um, notes from their doctor that said, you know, they will not be, they cannot get this vaccine. And they basically came back and said like you need to have a, you need to prove that you're going to have an anaphylactic reaction to the covid vaccine in order for this medical exemption to stand and so either they were fired or they quit so 
the religious exemption that got even crazier uh once the the newest vaccine came out that claimed that they didn't use like the fetal cell derivative then they the they excuse like they recanted on those exemptions and said like you have to re submit your exemption and so a bunch of people i work with had to resubmit their religious exemptions some of them were approved and some more were denied and there was no rhyme or reason and it was just that in itself was odd as far as patients you know in the beginning we're trying to encourage high-risk people to get vaccinated but then as the push came out i mean it just became so crazy like it was you, you know, I'd hear doctors talk like, oh, well, they don't, you know, they didn't get vaccinated because of the evil Fauci. And then they would laugh. And it was just like, it just became this mentality of the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated. And it just made medicine really ugly, really, really ugly. Yeah. It turned it political. I mean, it, it really, I, it sure. was one of those things I remember during this, this whole thing, as it was like really heating up. I remember, you know, hearing from some families who were concerned because they had an unvaccinated family member who was essentially just being shamed in the hospital. And they were like, how can we be confident that they're going to get care that they want them to live when they're so dedicated to the narrative that the unvaccinated are just, you know, at this high, you know, sort of likelihood of death. And mm -hmm. if that is the prevailing idea that a doctor has, I mean, I, I didn't know what to tell them because honestly, I don't know how you could be confident when you have a doctor who essentially has the mindset that, you know, number one, you're stupid or ignorant. And number two, that, you know, you're much more likely to die than a vaccinated person, which has turned out to, you know, now today we see statistics from all over the world. That's not the case. Now we're seeing vaccinated people dying at a higher clip than unvaccinated people all over in different places in the world. And we also are seeing that the more vaccines that you got, the more likely that you get the current iteration of COVID. And that's something that, again, we're not having a national conversation about and we're avoiding the subject in terms of, you know, all these excess deaths and, and you know, the realities of what's going on. So what do you see on the ground in the hospital? Are you seeing a difference in vaccinated versus unvaccinated patients who come in? And are you seeing vaccine injuries? Uh, now I feel like the, it's changing because people are coming out and talking and things are showing up that I don't feel like it's being pushed as much. I don't feel like, but, you know, the very first question out of everybody's mouth is like, well, are you vaccinated? However, I, we are seeing injuries. I've seen uh, Guillain-Barre, which is a neurologic disorder that progressively paralyzes somebody and again i can't attribute this to one thing but i've been there for you know almost 10 years and the the amount of strokes in young people has increased uh i've seen directly related to multiple boosters young people collapsing and going into weird heart rhythms that should not be an issue you know in your late 20s and 30s i've seen myocarditis it's definitely taking a toll yeah. I mean, that's been sort of the tough thing is that at the beginning, I feel like a lot of people who did get injured, and this is the crazy part to me, a lot of people who got vaccinated were very pro-vaccine, you know, were excited to get this and felt like it was going to be the best line of defense and so on and so forth. So these are not anti-vaxxers. These are not people who hated the vaccine. And these people... Now, today, when they come out and say they're injured, and this I'm talking about it sort of the beginning more so than right this second, but at the beginning and, and sort of middle of this, if they came out and said they were injured, they were treated like lepers. I mean, right. the media treated them like they were hypochondriacs and that they're lying about it. And, you know, every everybody in the medical community just shunned and ignored it. They didn't even want to report it to VAERS. And that's the thing I tell people, I don't trust the VAERS data. And the reason I don't trust it is because I know that in the medical community, it is frowned upon to even make a report in the VAERS system because there, there's a fear that if you do too many of these, that it could reflect poorly on you and make it look like you're a problem and like you're trying to create an issue, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I don't trust those numbers. And basically everybody I know in the medical community has affirmed that, yeah, you're right not to trust them. When you look at them, you should probably be putting a multiplier by it, you know, at least yeah. by a factor of six or seven, maybe more because of the amount who just will not report this stuff. And unfortunately, a lot of families do not push either and, and demand that it be, you know, done. Because again, 
you know, I think there's sort of this culture of, of fear around having the conversation. And that's something the media and I will say the CDC has done a very good job of creating. They have created that culture of fear. And I think it's incredibly unhealthy and something that does not produce good medicine. Because, um, you know, if we're having a really nuanced, honest conversation, that should include the fact that, number one, nobody can say with authority that there can never be a good vaccine. Okay, that's just, you know, that in itself is saying that, you know, you're confining science to a reality that um, is just not wise. I mean, the the possibilities are endless when it comes to any of these things. And I think that, you know, too much has been locked into a narrative that has been unhealthy. I do want to ask you something that, that has been kind of close to my heart, and that's that, you know, there was this culture built of separating patients from family. What did you see in that regard? Where, where things sort of change. Because again, I think there's actually a health component to this where having family and loved ones close to a patient when they're recovering actually builds up their morale and makes them, you know, I feel like fight harder. I know that, you know, when there's something on the line where your family's involved, people tend to fight harder. And when you're separated from them and you feel alone, the feelings even just mental health wise drain you into a place where you're less able to fight. And so what did you see in that regard from patients? That probably is the hardest thing I had to deal with. Um, I mean, I'm just a proponent in general and like regular medicine every day, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, whatever, like have family at your bedside. Um, if we're <clears throat> coding a patient, you know, I'm always the one, you know, one of like, yeah, let's get family back here. Let's let them, you know, be like how we're working, how hard we're working on their loved one. Or if, you know, they've been in a traumatic accident and, let's just get them bedside and we were just I mean we couldn't we couldn't get people back to be with their loved ones it, it was awful sorry no I mean I think don't apologize for being human your reaction is exactly the reaction that's why I said this this question specifically is close to my heart because the idea that anybody has the right to tear you apart from your family member especially as they may be dying is one of the most evil, vile, disgusting things I could imagine. And yeah, I'll never forgive the people who perpetuated that on us. I mean, they can apologize. They never will, but they, they could try apologizing all day long. It's one of the things that I deem unforgivable and irredeemable out of this whole situation is that that, that very declaration was the definition of authoritarian. It was the definition of tyranny. It's the definition of what our founders fought against when they created this country. Because... We have a right to life, liberty, and, you know, life in itself, that includes our family and our ability to be close to our family. And, and that's, a, yeah. that's, again, <laughs> something we can never, we can never give up. And, and that was really scary throughout COVID that, that so many people were forced into this. And still today, I know of hospitals today who are still doing this. Did, do you know of, of any who are still doing this today? It, our policy changes so often. I think most recently, they can now have like one visitor overnight. But I mean that, and that's pretty recent. I mean, within the last like three months, I would say if she, your loved one was like in a, on a regular floor, like not an ICU, you couldn't stay overnight with them. And even when it was going on, they our hospital had a, a policy that said like if, if they were going to die, you could have I think five family members. So you know, what if you have four kids and your wife or you know like how do you choose five people to come and say goodbye to you I, it's just it was the most like dehumanizing process yeah i i'm honestly i'm just sorry that so many people who disagreed with it had to be a part of it and i know some nurses you know they were sneaking family members in and that's something that they still can't talk about today but they were it was like an underground system of sneaking family members in because they disagreed so wholeheartedly with this and, um, you know, God bless them for doing that. But it was, yeah, I mean, just an incredibly, incredibly difficult time. I do want to ask you, you know, one of my big concerns with it was medical, medical neglect. And here's why. Because in my view, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, in my view, my life experience, one of the best things for anybody who is in a really terrible state when it comes to, to medicine, if they're really sick, is your family members being your advocates. When your family members can't see you and they don't know your actual condition, how are you supposed to advocate for somebody? And not only that, how can you trust they're getting the care that you've been told they're getting? Because 
we know of many cases. I mean, you look at just medical malpractice cases, as great of a job as many people do, especially nurses, medical malpractice happens on a regular basis in America. It's one of the leading causes of death in America. And so how can you trust or be that, you know, sort of advocate for your loved one if you're not allowed in the room and you're not allowed to see them or talk to them? I mean, that just, that makes no sense to me. So do you believe that this contributed to massive medical neglect? And what do you think the long-term effect of that is in your profession? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, family members, um, I mean, they know their loved one best, you know, um, sure. A nurse can spend 12 hours, you know, each shift or, you know, a couple days in a row, 12 hours and, you know, it can pick up on a lot, but there's been times where, you know, if the, especially if the patient's intubated, you know, the family member might know a drug allergy that is not in the chart or just a reaction in general that they've had to a medication prior mental status change. You know, this, you know, what if I'm coming in at night and they've been fine all day and I get report like, yeah, they're alert and oriented times four. And, you know, all of a sudden now things have gone sideways. Like, is this baseline? Do they get a little kooky at night, which sometimes happens and, you know, does the family member know that? Or is, you know, something acutely wrong with them? Yeah, I, re I rely on fa family for a ton of stuff. And, you know, you get patients who, who aren't verbal even. I had one, you know, they were the only ones that could tell us that the patient was seizing because it was just such a minor thing. And, and so we would have never known the patient was seizing and needed, you know, suctioning. Like, it, it's things like that that I just can't understand why we wouldn't want family at the bedside. It just, it makes no logical sense. I mean, what would you say was the hardest for you personally throughout all this, having to deal with it and do your job and stay, you know, I mean, that's the other thing is uh, I'm sure so many of these things made you emotional, but you had to hold it together because you're at work, you know, and, and, and how did you deal with that? What was the most difficult part for you? Definitely the separation of family. Um, like I, we were able to get people back for us down in like the ER, but like what happened when they left, like we had no control over. So fighting tooth and nail with other coworkers and just like trying to scream at them, like, can we have some common sense? Can we think outside what we're told, you know, was probably the most frustrating. And then when things just got so political, it was like, politics has no place in medicine, whatever your stance is. Like it should be what is best for the patient. I don't care what your political stance is. Absolutely. I mean, I, I hope people take that to heart. That's something I've really tried to stress throughout all of these interviews with with anonymous medical professionals is that this shouldn't be about politics. It's it's actually really disgusting that it has become about politics. Unfortunately, yes, one side's politicians more than the other side have been perpetuating this. But in terms of common sense, if we don't get back to a world where common sense, by and large, across all parties, includes the fact that people are entitled to be with their family members when they're, you know, in this sort of place where they're in the hospital and that you don't have a right to force inject people or you don't have a right to discriminate against people based on their their vaccination status, things along these lines. If we can't get to that place, I think we're headed down a very dangerous path. And I think that that may end up being the most dangerous thing about COVID is the psychological effects and the societal effects and how divided it made people, not so much the virus, you know, and, and I think that a lot of people I trust in the medical community really feel like that has become the true pandemic is, is how it's divided society and how it has changed the mental health, really, frankly, of the, of the world, because this has changed so many things. You look at the effect on children when it comes to education and school, and you look at the effect this has had just on people and relationships and family members. I mean, people won't even have Thanksgiving dinner with family members now because of things that they disagreed on throughout COVID. And once you dig in on one side or the other of this, you know, it's really hard to bring people to a place where they go, okay, I'm willing to, you know, kind of come to this middle point where we have common sense and see each other's point of view. Um, now, see, there's certain things you can't come to a point of view on. I can't understand somebody's point of view when it comes to dividing people from their family members. Like there's certain things that are just human rights abuses, in my opinion, and that's one of them. Last question for you. If you were to create a law that were to prevent everything that has gone awry during this, what would it look like for you as a medical professional? Like what needs to change in the law to prevent these abuses that we saw throughout COVID and the failures we saw throughout COVID? Uh, first and foremost, that patients always, always have the right to have a loved one at their bedside. 
I just, I can't imagine being in a hospital by yourself with no, no advocate, no support system. And I, I think that's just like my biggest takeaway from this. And it's, it's, I mean, it's such common sense. This just, it's still heartbreaking today because so many people lost their loved ones and never got to say goodbye. And um, I don't think we can ever forgive that. I think we can fix it in terms of the law in the future, but we can never fix it for those families. They lost the one and only chance they had, you know, and I'm sure, you know, they tried to move on in other ways and grieve in other ways, but nobody can ever give them that moment back, you know, right. and uh, we've got to fix it. There's, there's just no, there's no other way to say it. I mean, we've got to fix it and make sure this never happens again. Thank you so much for using your voice and for speaking with me. I hope that granting anonymity to all the people that we did will actually help people understand the raw truth of what happened dur during COVID. Because I think sometimes when you have to worry about your license and other things, people will gloss over details and maybe not get as raw and real about what happened. And so I thank you so much for, for your time and for, you know, telling us the truth about what happened throughout COVID. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for joining me on today's episode. If you liked what you heard, tag me on social media, repost clips from it, share it with your friends. You sharing our show is how we grow and it's how we get the truth out there. So if you want to help spread the truth and help wake people up, please go and share our show. Go to our website, RobbieStarbuck.com for more information or to watch old episodes. See you at the next episode.